Hey, you guys, today I am so excited because as you can see, I have a special guest with me today, but we're gonna dive into some subjects that I think are really important, very challenging, but very important. So I have with me today author Michael Easter. Michael, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. So appreciate it. So I actually got to know you through your first book, The Comfort Crisis, which I've talked about on the show before. And he actually has a new book out called Scarcity Brain, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit. But uh, Comfort Crisis, that book, we were on a trip as a family, I think about a year and a half ago. And my brother had it. And he was like, hey, and he bought a copy for my dad for Christmas. And he was like, yeah, this is a good book. Like, I feel like we all should read it. And I love to read. So I was like, oh my gosh, yeah. So I started reading it, read it in like a day and a half at the beach, which is the opposite (laughs) of the whole book, I feel like. But it was, but you did such a great job though, I think of pairing real life examples and experiences and this challenge, because the whole book is just about how we are so conditioned now just to be comfortable, right? And it goes into a lot more, but from a physical standpoint, a mental standpoint, I mean, all of it. And so uh, I'm just curious for you, like when people read this book, The Comfort Crisis specifically, mm-hmm. what's like one of their biggest takeaways? Like what do they, when they when you talk to them, what's like the biggest thing? Because for me, it was such a challenge because I am probably the stereotype of like, yeah, I want to be comfortable, right? In human nature, we want to be, but we weren't built for that. And we have so much more that we can be stretched and we're not going to, yeah. We're not going to just like crumble and fall. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, everyone wants to do the next most comfortable, next easiest thing. And for all of time, that served us when the world was a lot harsher and we had to go hunt and gather for food and we were exposed to the elements and all these different things. Um, but today it doesn't always serve us and can even backfire. To answer your question, what resonated with people? It's a good one because there's different sections that look at different ideas. So like Mm -hmm. how our relationship to nature has changed, how our relationship to challenge has changed, um, how physical activity has changed. And it's kind of telling because certain people gravitate to different sections, you know? And so it's kind of, for me, it's, I'll always ask, what was your favorite section? Yes. Um, And the answers are always kind of different. What was your favorite section? The physical side. Mm -hmm. Like you go through Mm -hmm. even how a body is created and how... Like where your weight, like rucking, right? Like having a like a rucksack. We're built to have weight on our back. We're not built just to like run freely because we were built to gather food, right? Like it's yeah. just like this. I mean, it's just that stuff was fascinating. And it's probably my biggest challenge because I don't physically like to push myself very much. Yeah. I tried training for a marathon and I quit like day three. And my long run that was like a mile. I was like, yeah, this is for the birds. I don't I don't want to do this. Um, well, but, you're, well, the good news is that congratulations are very normal. Oh, thank you. Thank you. The yes. idea of people going out and being physically active and burning calories just for the sake of it yeah. is a brand new idea in the grand scheme of time and space. We only started doing it uh, after the Industrial Revolution, once we basically engineered activity out of our life and went, mm. wait a minute, now that we don't move around as much, we seem to get more disease. And we're like, oh, well, maybe we should find a way to be more active. Okay, let's invent gyms. Let's just run just to run. Let's like, just call it exercise. Yeah, we'll call it exercise. <laughs> um, for all of time, people avoided physical activity because you don't want to burn calories. Cause, right, right. Because food was hard to come by. Yep. Well, my husband and I have started working out He's worked out always, but and it's been so good because it's you're uncomfortable, right? You're so I mean, all yeah. of it. And then we got a sauna. So then the mm-hmm. uncomfortable stuff of the elements of like the high heat to like a cold plunge, yeah. like that whole thing, right? I mean, all of it because I'm like, it's true. Like the science behind it, the discomfort actually brings such strength. And so, uh, you know, on this show we talk so much about money and specifically sacrificing lifestyle mm-hmm. to get where you want to be financially because so many people live above their means and the stress and all that that comes with it. So when people are getting out of debt, you know, I tell them like, hey, for a season, just cut cut everything out. Cut everything out. Find the margin you can to get ahead on that goal. But it's uncomfortable. And people totally. are used to their routine. They're used to living at a certain level, right? And when you tell someone to go below that, it feels off because I feel like we're so naturally wired to continue to achieve. And when you cut things out, it can be so difficult. So what would you say to somebody like through the comfort crisis lens who is walking through that journey and they're like, okay, yeah, it is uncomfortable to do things differently. And my, even from a lifestyle standpoint to gain ground, but there has to be a level of that sacrifice. So in the book, I talk about how we basically adapt to the level of comfort we're at and the level of comfort that we used to think was great now becomes uncomfortable. So if you put it in context of 
of most of time. You know, even 50 years ago, the level of being the most comfortable person on the block, you would look at today and be like, oh, that, oh, oh my gosh, I can't it's, believe they're living like that's that. That's terrible. <laughs> they only have one car? Oh my gosh, how could, how could anyone do that? Yeah. And so I think that really um, put ourselves in a situation that's uncomfortable. It's because we were at a level of comfort before and we'll eventually adapt there too. But mm-hmm. there's, oh, it's not going to be a two second thing where you go, oh man, this is a little uncomfortable now, uh, but actually I feel great immediately, right? There's going to be a little bit of an adaptation period, but the yeah. reality is, is that, you know, your grandparents were perfectly happy and their lives were a lot more uncomfortable and didn't have as much as you had. And same with their grandparents and on and on and on and on. So yeah. a lot of times what we consider uh, comfortable is just sort of determined by time and space, where we are. Yeah, yeah. In a hundred years, people are going to look back at how you and I are living and be like, oh my God, I can't believe they live like that. That how is they, terrible. How are they surviving? Yes, what, a, what an insane survive? lifestyle. <laughs> and so keeping that in the back of your mind that, you know, we're just sort of creatures of our environment in a yes. way and we're always comparing. Yeah. Um, not always in a way that improves our decision-making and right. improves our mental health and improves, uh, most importantly, you know, our life satisfaction. Yeah. It is important to know because once you can kind of look back at that machinery and see how the machinery works, you can go, oh, okay, well, maybe maybe I'm not making a super rational <laughs> decision uh-huh, right now. Uh-huh. Do you look at the wor- world and are you, like, discouraged? Or are you just like, oh, my gosh, are we just, like, the worst human <laughs> beings in the generation with just uh, all the, like, instant gratification? I mean, everything we have that we want, we can basically get yeah. for what I feel like, you know, for the most part. Do you, like, is it, like, what do you think? Like, when you just, like, look out or see, you know, not even the news, but just, like, just society in general and how we're functioning. Well, I will say that I have to stay off my HOA's Facebook page where I go absolutely <laughs> mad with the <laughs> problems that people bring up, problems that people bring up. Um, I think that as we've advanced as a society, I think things have as a whole gotten um, better mm-hmm. and that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but having first, first, world, first world problems yeah. is kind of the price of progress. And a lot of times our advances, they come with side effects that we're not always aware of. So to kind of go back to our exercise one, it's like we've totally engineered exercise out of our life, Yeah. which look, I don't want to have to go hunt and gather for every meal that I get. But at the same time, if I don't find a way to replace that, activity I would have had in the past, I'm, it's probably not going to be good for me in the long run. Yeah. So you have to do some seemingly strange things today in order to live well. And oftentimes they're going to be uncomfortable. And um, yeah, as far as, you know, where we'll be in the future, I don't know. Yeah. It's, I, I have moments where I'm very optimistic. I have moments where I'm very pessimistic. And um, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. But we'll I try see. and focus on the positive. Yeah. So. Oh, us people out there, you know, you know what it is. Okay, so your newest book, Scarcity Brain, it came out in September. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so what caused you to write write this? What was kind of the, the thought behind it? Yeah, so um, March 2020, the pandemic happens. Uh-huh. The news comes out. Uh, okay, we're, we're shutting down. I go to the grocery store. I have a long list of items of food that I need to get ready for the for this thing. Literally everything in the store is gone, right? Mm-hmm. Like you go, this thing's not here. This thing's not here. And then I see this guy with this uh, shopping cart that's got this, he's just piled with cans and he's in a Tyvek suit and he's wearing a gas mask and he's got these glasses on. And I just saw that. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is like, you know, it's coming. And so your natural inclination, everyone's inclination into that, when they thought that what they needed to survive was scarce, we all went into like hoarder mode. Everyone yeah. freak out, right? Get yeah. as much toilet paper as you can. Yes. We're going to need a, a hundred thousand gallons at least of hand sanitizer, right? Um, <clears throat> so after we have this initial freak out of, of hoarding when the pandemic first sets in, then you start to see uh, this new trend set in where people start to uh, acquire more in different ways. So mm-hmm. shopping increases. Online shopping has never been higher. Yeah. Um, you start to see a lot of people gain a significant amount of weight we start moving even less. Screen time goes through the roof. Mm -hmm. Um, People spend insane amounts of time going down crazy information rabbit holes, especially with the pandemic. (laughs) Who would that be, Michael? Who would that be? (laughs) Conspiracy theory. And so uh, I kind of just wanted to know why that is. Yeah. And um, I sort of started researching the phenomenon and kind of realized that, you know, we are creatures who, whenever we think something that we need to survive might be scarce, our reaction is to go and get more of it. Hmm. The thing is, is uh, we now live in a world where everything we need to survive is abundant. And yet we still have this sort of drive to acquire more food, uh, more stuff, more information, 
oh, more status, right? And all these things are, have just been put at scale. So status, we now have social media, yeah. right? There's yeah. m- millions of people and it gets quantified. The average home today has more than 10,000 items. We used to have maybe 100 items in a, ha- in a house right. 150 years ago. Uh, a person today sees more information in one day than they would have seen their entire life 700 years ago. No way. Yeah, and then, I mean, just food, we throw out about a third of the food we produce, yeah. you know? And um, so the book really looks at all these things that we're sort of built to crave and how um, technology is really pushing us into over-consuming them Mm -hmm. and how that's come with a lot of downsides. I mean, relevant to what you guys talk about here, just financially, like people spend so much money on things they don't need. Yep, yep. But we think we need them because of uh, marketing or because of, you know, we're bored. And so like we're sitting on our couch and scrolling Amazon, like, oh, I'll buy that. Even 10 years ago, you would have had to drive down to the store and buy it. So you just wouldn't have bought it. Okay, so that is interesting because needs versus wants uh, it's a big conversation, I feel like, that we always have to be able to evaluate and prioritize, like, your budget or things, right? Or if you're cutting out things to get, you know, get out of debt or save up your emergency fund. Like, whatever it is, evaluating needs versus wants is huge. And what's so funny is walking through someone's budget even and seeing mm-hmm. what they're like, no, 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 but you just assume, like, no, I have to have that. And so mm-hmm. chipping some of that away, kind of going back to even comfort, right? Like, it's uncomfortable, so what, it, for you, as you're doing all this research, like seeing that blend so tightly, and it's just, I guess, what we get used to, mm-hmm. but why have those needs and those wants overlapped? And it's like, it's, and it feels like they're so tangled up that you can't even disperse, like, what is a need and what is a want? I mean, for some people, it's, it's, it's bizarre. Yeah, like the car thing, like seriously, it's like, well, sell the car. Right. And it's assumed, well, we have to have two because X, Y, Z, and I get logistically all of that, but there's a lot of people that survived with one car for a season. And yeah. so it's just wild to think and to ask people, like, hey, if you want to get a, get ahead, that sacrifice has to happen. So the needs versus wants, why is that so entangled today? That, well, I think that, you know, we always say that uh, necessity is the mother of invention, mm-hmm. but I think that it's actually the other way around. Invention is the mother of necessity. So something gets <laughs> produced, a lot of people buy it. We see other people with it. We think, oh, that could probably improve my life too. And we start to think that like, oh, we absolutely need this thing. And a lot of it is societally uh, driven. And I think that can get people into trouble. More importantly is that I think um, we live in a world now where we're seeing so many um, cues that we do need this stuff, Mm -hmm. you know, through our phones, through TV, that it's easy to start to believe that story. Mm -hmm. But it is ultimately a story, you know? You know, a lot of what I look at is, um, you know, everyone knows that everything is fine in moderation. Mm -hmm. You know, we all suck at it. Yes, yes. (laughs) And so, why is that? Yeah. Living, so I live in Las Vegas, and there's slot machines all over town, and people will play these things for hours and hours on Mm. end. And to me, that's like the most irrational behavior ever. Right. It really is just, you are, you just can't get enough of this thing, and why are you doing it? To understand why people play these things. I mm-hmm. end up traveling into this um, casino lab. So it's not really open to the public. It is oh, used entirely for human behavior research. And it's funded by the gambling industry and big tech. From this experience, I learn uh, why slot machines are so good at hooking people. And it relies on this three-part system that I call the scarcity loop. Okay. Three parts. So one is opportunity. There's an opportunity to get something of value. Mm-hmm. Two is unpredictable rewards. You know you'll get that thing of value if you just keep repeating the behavior. Mm. But you don't know when, and you don't know how valuable it'll be. And then three, uh, quick repeatability. You can repeat the behavior immediately, like over and over and over. The cycle is just like right there, yeah. Yeah, so you see it on the slot machine. Like, I can win some money. I know if I play a game, like, I could lose. I could win a little bit, or I could win a lot. And that's really exciting. That hooks all all animals focus on unpredictability. Three, quick repeatability. People play, like, 16 games a minute, which is crazy. Oh, my god. More than we blink. Now, the reason that there's, uh, it's not just the gambling companies invested in this place, it's also big tech, is because you can put this system in all sorts of other things Mm. to get people to repeat a behavior over and over and over that is fun in the short term, but can hurt them in the long run. Yep. So, for example, it's what makes social media work. 
It's what makes dating apps so compelling. It's being put in a lot of um, online retailers and mm. advertisements. It's being put in a lot of personal finance apps like Robinhood that dial up the quick repeatability. Yeah. Uh, it explains the rise of uh, sports gambling and all these different things. So I think um, that's kind of a long way of saying we have so many um, different forms of tech in our life, mm-hmm. along with so much data on what makes humans consume and yes. buy more and spend money. I mean, there's literally labs where they're studying this that we're up against a lot. Whereas That's right. That's we never right. we never had this. Even That's right. even 40 years ago, yep. you know, we knew a lot about consumer behavior, but it wasn't on a person's in a person's hand all the time. Constantly yeah. feeling like a need to, right. right? Like, well, I have to have the phone. So yeah. then you're just already sucked into like the world of it all. And that's what's wild to me. And that's what I, I think about this a lot, whether I'm online on Amazon or whatever. And I'm like, like, these are these are billion dollar industries. Like, mm-hmm. like some of the smartest people on the planet in Silicon Valley, like wherever they are, they know what they're doing. And here's like little old me in Nashville, Tennessee mm-hmm. on my phone, thinking somehow I'm going to outsmart them with the 30% off sale that the whatever I'm seeing from the email that I got, right? Like, mm-hmm. it's like, you kind of have to like snap out of it and be like, wake up y'all, wake up. So, yeah. and, you know, and within the credit card industry too, I feel like they're brilliant at all oh, of yeah. that. Second people write in and they know what they're doing. And so I think there's this, it's naive to think, well, yeah, I have, you know, I have the ability to be okay all the time. I'm just going to do what I want to do. You, you have to be aware. It's like this cautionary aware, but... tale to say like, no, 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 there's industries literally after you, whether it's to get your money, your time, your attention, all of it. And so it's just, yeah, it's not to be fearful of, but it's just to be aware and don't just like sleepwalk through Yeah, I think life. Yeah, I think that one of the ways to get out of a lot of these behaviors is to your point one, becoming aware of yeah. that you're in it. And there's good, there's good reasons for that. Like we... Um, we tend to focus on things that are unpredictable, um, whether it be like, oh, this limited time bargain that you, you yeah. only you got, whether it be a yeah. uh, gambling game, um, for reasons that go back to um, how we used to survive with finding food. So, you know, we used to have to walk the earth to find food, and it was very unpredictable. Mm-hmm. So you go to point A, no food. Point B, no food. Point C, jackpot. There's so much food. And by the way, you have to repeat that the next day. That is the exact same architecture as a slot machine. It's wild. Opportunity to get something. You don't know when it's going to happen. You don't know how good it's going to be. And you got to repeat it all the time. And so we're, we're sort of built to fall into this. Mm-hmm. Um, so being aware of like, oh, that's just my brain doing this thing that it thinks is good. Yeah. Two is, um, you know, those three parts that I laid out. If you can change or remove any of the parts, mm-hmm. that slows down the behavior. So for example, um, with the, we'll take shopping. If you um, shift your mindset of why am I buying this item in the first place? So what is the opportunity I'm getting from this thing? Mm -hmm. If you really ask yourself, a lot of times we don't know. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm just, what am I really getting from this, right? And Mm -hmm. so shifting to like, how am I using this to a tool, uh, as a tool? And how is it really going to allow me to do this thing? And is there another way that I could do that same thing with something I already own. Yes, and not having to buy. Is that when you talk about the merch versus stuff? Yeah. Is that yeah. kind of in that yeah. mentality? Yeah, exactly. Because even changing your words, yeah. you said that, like, yes. how important that is. So I put it in, um, yeah, I put it in terms of uh, gear versus stuff. So gear is something that can allow you to achieve some higher goal or higher purpose, whereas mm-hmm. stuff is just like, you kind of get it for the sake of it. Another example would be slowing down how quickly you can do the behavior of shopping. Mm-hmm. So even something as stupid as, like I said before, like, I'm only going to buy stuff in person. Now you have to drive to the store. Yeah. It's a pain, yep. right? And yep. along the way, you're probably going to forget what you were going to buy anyways. <laughs> totally. <laughs> if you have to buy something online, it could be like, all right, I'm putting a three-day holding period on. And so, like, I'm not going to buy it unless I'm for sure I uh, think I still need it in three days. Chances are you'll probably come to your senses. Mm-hmm. But basically, as a general rule with um, human behavior is that the faster you can repeat a behavior— the more likely you are to repeat it. Mm -hmm. So speed is kind of the ultimate currency when you think of this is why places do limited time deals. Oh, by the way, we only have three left, right? And so these these triggers really just lead us to do things that um, I think sometimes we wish we wouldn't have. (laughs) Yes, yes. Oh, for sure. That's so interesting. Okay, so you mentioned too in the book just about minimalism and how it's not always like the best. I feel like minimalism has kind of become this like buzzword and— People are like, I want to be a minimalist and all of this, right? And I can see some benefits, right? Just mm-hmm. in the overall messaging of like, yes, we just don't need all the crap that we have. We just don't need it. 
Um, so talk me through through that part of the book. Yeah, so this is from a uh, psychologist I talked to who's at University of Michigan. Her name okay. is uh, Stephanie Preston. Her conclusion is that uh, minimalism and acquiring too much, so almost like light hoarding you can yeah. think of, they're driven by the same thing. And it is, uh, essentially, it's kind of uh, driven by anxiety. So she, uh, her research shows that people who are really bad at uh, getting rid of stuff and acquire too much, they do it because they, it gives them a feeling of control. I might need this at some point. Mm-hmm. I might need this. Oh, I could use this. Like, I don't want to get rid of it. Minimalists, on the other hand, it gives them a sense of control. Mm. Everything is in its perfect place. My environment is perfectly tuned to exactly how I want it, and everything is going to be fine, right? So it's mm-hmm. really driven by something that has nothing to do with the stuff, the stuff itself. It's, uh-huh, uh-huh. And so what she's observed is that people will, um, your average person will buy a bunch of stuff, and then they'll kind of look at their space at some point and go, oh my gosh, I have so much stuff. I need to get rid of it. I need to minimize. So they'll throw out a bunch of stuff. And then they'll start buying again. (laughs) And then they'll just kind of accumulate and accumulate. And then they'll hit that point again. So she really pointed out is that people go through cycles. And they haven't really stopped and asked, why am I buying so much stuff in the first place? Because if you can answer that question, not only do you not have to do the crazy purge, you just won't acquire more. And you'll end up saving more money in the long run. And it is. It's so true. I'm like, it's never usually about the stuff or the money, but it's the why underneath. Yeah. Why am I doing it in the first place? Am I bored? Am I insecure? Do I want, is is it the comparison game? Like, right, like, what is that? And when I can fix that part of me, Mm -hmm. then the output, you know, automatically helps change the habit that's created. Yeah, and so, you know, with minimalism, you know, a lot of people will be like, okay, I need, I'm going to be minimalist. I need to go buy to the container store and buy a bunch of containers (laughs) so I can be a minimalist. To organize all of them. How does that work, you know? Yes, totally. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so good. Michael, thank you so much. I so appreciate it. I think it's such good conversation and I just appreciate the challenge to all of it because you can just get in this place where I'm like, your norm takes over your life. And until you kind of shake it up and realize, oh my gosh, something could be done differently and probably better in certain areas is so huge. And the fact that the, I love that this book and how it all started and all the science behind it all, you just do so, you do such great research and all of your, all of your stuff. So I, I appreciate that because as the reader, I'm always like, oh my gosh, this is so good. Someone way smarter than me <laughs> put all of this in a great book for us, you guys, to be able to read it. So you guys make sure to check out Scarcity Brain by Michael Easter. Here's the cover. It's, uh, it's awesome. And all the stuff he writes in the Course Comfort Crisis. Such a great book. So where can everyone find you? I'm at eastermichael.com. And then on social media, I'm Michael underscore Easter. Yeah, that's right. So great. Thanks, Michael. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Thank you, guys. And again, make sure to check out everything that he's doing. And remember to take control of your money and create a life you love. 